Welcome to the ninth presentation in the second webinar series presented by the International Adsorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing adsorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges through the promotion of adsorption research and education. We hope that all of our attendees, their families, and their colleagues are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series begun in the spring of 2020 and then restarted in the autumn of that year has been an immense success, and the recordings of those webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube. This is the final webinar of our second series, but plans are already underway to begin a third series later this year. We intend to continue with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PH students and early career researchers. Announcements regarding the third series will be distributed through the IAS mailing list and the IAS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by professors Hideki Tanaka of Shinsu University and Chotaro Hiraide of Kyoto University. I'm Daniel Sedarius of NIST in the United States and the Secretary Treasurer of the IAS. Today's webinar will be moderated by Nick Wilkins of the University of Alberta in Canada and David Donacci of Imperial College London in the UK. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or of the institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, Adsorption, contribute to travel grants and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of adsorption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the adsorption database published by Springer Materials. The membership renewal season begins on, 20, on October 1st, later this week, and any payments made on or after that date will apply to 2022. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter at our handle at IntAdSOS for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help expand our YouTube channel by subscribing. The IAS will host the 14th International Conference on the Fundamentals of Absorption in May 2022 in Broomfield, Colorado, near Denver. The conference will cover all aspects of absorption ranging from fundamentals, process and applications, green energy, and others. Beyond the scientific content, the setting is outstanding, just downhill from the mountains of Western Colorado, which will allow for excellent side trips and excursions. Abstract submission is open through October 15th of 2021. The URL on screen has additional details. Registration information is already online and an official opening for registrations will be announced in the first months of 2022. And now I'd like to hand off uh, the moderation duties to Nick Wilkins from the University of Alberta and he will introduce our speakers and take us into the presentations. Thanks, Dan. As uh, Dan just said, my name is Nick Wilkins and I will be moderating today's webinar with David Donacci. Our first speaker today is Dr. Hideki Tanaka of Shinshu University in Japan. Dr. Tanaka received his doctorate at Chiba University in 2002. He then did two postdocs, one at Chiba University and another at the Japan Science and Technology Agency. Previously, he was also an assistant professor at Chiba University and an assistant professor, lecturer, and associate professor at Kyoto University. He's currently a director of the uh, International Absorption Society. His research interests include modeling of gas absorption and separations. During the webinar today, questions can be submitted to the speaker in one of two ways either uh, through the Q&A tab on Zoom or as comments on YouTube. Those comments will be collected by David and sent here to Zoom where we will ask them to the speakers. And with that, I will hand off the uh, presentation to Dr. Tanaka. Thank you for your kind introduction. First of all, we'd like to thank the organizing committee for giving us an opportunity to talk in this IAS webinar. Here is an outline 
of our talk, which is divided into two parts. Part one, part two will be given by later by Dr. Shotaro Hiraide, who has for the most part conducted all of the research introduced today. I will present part one, which includes a brief background on flexible metal organic frameworks and discuss the thermodynamic modeling of gate adsorption in flexible molds. After that, I will discuss the application of flexible MOFs for carbon dioxide separation and explain these important concepts, pressure-aided facilitating thermal management, tripping of and sequential count system. Most have been classified into three different generations by Professor Kitagawa based on their behavior after the removal of guests in the synthesized crystals. Third generation MOVs do not collapse like first generation MOVs do. Instead, they deform after guest removal. This is because they have flexible framework, which causes them to undergo a structural transition induced by guest adsorption. There are various models of structural transition, such as expansion of the interlayer distance, sliding of the interpenetrative frameworks, uh, deformation of coordination angles, and rotation of linkers. These structural transitions induced by gate adsorption are called gate adsorption or pleasing. Now let me introduce the thermodynamic modeling of gate adsorption in flexible MOVs. Here is a typical gate adsorption item as a function of the chemical potential of the gas, which corresponds to the gas pressure of the gas molecules. The item exhibits a step change due to the structural transition of the host framework induced by gas adsorption. The slope of the free energy changes where gate adsorption takes place because gate adsorption involves a phase transition. According to Professor Kudat, the system can be understood by combining two fictitious items and their associated free energies. The blue item is for a virtually fixed open host framework, while the green item is for a virtually fixed closed host framework. The fixed open host framework had the structure after gate adsorption without the guest, and the structure is frozen. And the fixed closed host framework had the structure before gate adsorption and the intersection between the associated free energies is where gate adsorption occurs. The osmotic free energy of the system is represented as the sum of the ham host free energy change of the host PV term and the ground potential of the guest. The ground potential of the guest can be calculated by integrating the fictitious height term. This slide shows the case for the fixed open host framework. And the free energy of the system decreases with an increase in the chemical potential because of the adsorption of the gas in the host framework. For the fixed closed host framework, the adsorption amount of the gas should be zero when the host framework does not have enough spaces to accommodate the guest. In this case, the free energy of the system is constant when the gas pressure P is negligibly small. And we obtain this thermodynamic equation by taking the difference between the two osmotic free energies. This equation shows that gate adsorption takes place when the 
destabilization of the host due to the host flame of expansion is compensated for by the stabilization due to guest adsorption. Here we assume that the ground potential of the guest for the fixed closed host framework was zero and the gas pressure P was negligibly small. There are two methods for obtaining fictitious items. The FAT method, which was proposed by Professor Kudat, is to fit Langomir type items to experimental items, both before and after gate adsorption. The second method is to calculate the fictitious items for the fixed open host and the fixed closed host frameworks using the Grand Canonical Monte Carlo simulation. This method can provide precise fictitious items if you know the two host framework structures. However, as mentioned before, the closed host framework structure is not required if its absorption amount is negligibly small. Now I will present an example of the second method for modeling the thermodynamics of gate absorption. This includes structural determination of host frameworks, molecule simulations, and free energy analysis. We focus on um, elastic layer structured MOF11 called L11, in which gate absorption was first reported in 2001. L11 exhibits gate absorption of carbon dioxide which is a kind of molecule recognition. Therefore, LMA 11 has a large selectivity for carbon dioxide. And also LMA 11 gives a large working capacity with a small pressure swing. These, therefore, these excellent characteristics of LMA 11 have attracted many researchers. Therefore, we'd like to talk about the content of our people concerning M11 in this presentation. As mentioned earlier, we need to know the host framework structures for the GCMC simulation. Therefore, we conducted the in situ synchrotron X ray powder diffraction measurements at BL or to be the beamline of spring rate in Japan. This is the XLPD pattern of L11 with accommodated carbon dioxide. We analyzed the XLPD pattern using the little bit method to obtain the host framework structures of L11. I will not go into the details of the little bit method, but this is a least squares of refinement of the crystal structure carried out until the best fit is obtained between the observed XLPD pattern and the calculated pattern. What you see here is the crystal structures of L11 before and after gating obtained by the little belt method. L11 has the two-dimensional square grid layers stacking with the shift and it has no borders to accommodate carbon dioxide. And after gating, the skeleton of the layers does not change very much. However, the interlayer distance increases by 30% to accommodate carbon dioxide. The obtained structures reveal that gate adsorption of carbon dioxide occurs due to the generation of a path by the withdrawal of BF4 anions from the square grid accompanied by the widening of the interlayer distance. And after the withdrawal of BF4 anions, one-dimensional channels composed of the stacked square grids were formed. This suggests that the carbon dioxide may diffuse through these one-dimensional channels and that 
a pair of bifurcated ions functions as a gate. We optimize the structures obtained from the little bit method using the DFTD calculations. Yale represent the structures from the little bit analysis and let represent the DFTD optimized structures. As can be observed, the red structure almost completely coincide with the yellow ones, which suggest that our little bit analysis was successful. The DFTD calculations enabled us to determine the potential energy change of the host framework due to gate assumption. As expected, the host framework structure was destabilized because the change in the non-bonded potential was positive. However, interestingly, the bonded potential increased, which suggests that the two-dimensional square grid layers of M11 were stabilized because the distorted bonds in the host framework were relaxed after gate absorption. We then estimated the partial charges in the host framework using the DFT calculations and modeled a force field for the interaction between the host framework and carbon dioxide in order to perform the GCMC simulation. And as you can see, we confirmed that our force field closely reproduced the potential energy of the absorbed carbon dioxide obtained from the DFTD calculations. What you see here is the fictitious item of carbon dioxide for the fixed open host framework of L11 obtained by GCMC and the ground potential of the gas calculated by integrating this fictitious item. And here we can see the experimental gate absorption item, which shows that the free energy of the system should be zero at this gate pressure. We then determine the Helmholtz free energy change of the host to be 12.1 kilojoule per mole using this thermodynamic equation, which was shown previously. And the Helmholtz free energy is a function of the temperature. So we calculated the fictitious items at different temperatures using GCMC and determined the Helmholtz free energy change of the host by referring to the experimental gate issues. It is clear that there is a linear correlation between the Helmholtz free energy change of the host and the temperature. Therefore, we determine the internal energy change of the host and the entropy change of the host by the least squares fitting of this thermodynamic equation. And here, the internal energy change of the host can be approximated by the potential energy of the host. As can be seen, the potential energy change of the host obtained from the free energy analysis in good agreement with that separately obtained from the DFTD calculations. This suggests that our thermodynamic model of gate assumption is appropriate. Now, I will give a brief introduction to the fact that M11 exhibits large gate absorption of carbon dioxide on M11 as shown at low temperature as shown here. In the same way, we determine the characteristic crystal structures of M11 with different carbon dioxide buildings using the little bit method and successfully analyze the free energy change of the, the system for the multi-gate absorption of carbon dioxide on L11. For the details, please see this paper. 
Now, let me move on to the application of flexible MOFs for carbon dioxide separation. One of the challenges in developing a highly efficient pressure vacuum sink adsorption system for carbon dioxide separation is realization of rapid adsorption and desorption processes. It can increase the throughput of carbon dioxide per unit of time and reduce the size of adsorption turbos, resulting in an overall cost reduction for carbon dioxide separation systems. However, such adiabatic rapid adsorption and desorption typically cause thermal management problems to occur inside the adsorption tower. For example, in the adsorption process, the temperature increase of the adsorbent due to the heat of adsorption causes a decrease in the carbon dioxide adsorption amount. From this perspective, um, innovative adsorbent for highly efficient PVSA system will have fast adsorption and desorption rate, intrinsic thermal management capability, high carbon dioxide selectivity, and large carbon dioxide working capacity. Recent Mason SLL reported that a flexible MOF, which shows a stabilized in the adsorption item of methane due to gate adsorption, has the intrinsic thermal management capability. They showed that the exothermic endothermic heat from the host framework expansion can be can partially offset the exothermic heat from guest adsorption. And this can enable rapid filling by adsorption gas, which is essential for adsorbed natural gas vehicles. We therefore focus on using the flexible modes to suppress the heat of carbon dioxide adsorption and desorption by means of the entropy change due to the structural transition of the host framework. During the adsorption process, the exothermic heat generated by the selective carbon dioxide adsorption can be suppressed by the endothermic heat due to the expansion of host framework. Conversely, in the desorption process, the endothermic heat generated by carbon dioxide desorption can be suppressed by the exothermic heat due to the shrinkage of host framework. And here, these structural transitions must be extremely fast to realize the rapid adsorption and desorption processes. Therefore, we investigated how, M, how fast M11 can achieve gate adsorption. We performed time release of the inside synchrotron XLPD measurement at spring weight. The XLPD patterns were continuously generated by exposing the sample to X rays for one second at regular intervals of 50 milliseconds during the carbon dioxide adsorption and desorption. Here is a curve map of the XLPD patterns as a function of time for the carbon dioxide adsorption with a constant pressure of 40.8 kilopascal at 273 degrees Kelvin. From this, we obtained the fraction of phase transformed as a function of time. It can be seen that after the introduction of carbon dioxide gas, ELM11 started to transform immediately, and the phase transition was accomplished after approximately 10 seconds. We also investigated the temperature dependence and the pressure dependence of the fraction of phase transformed versus time. And we fit the Kolmogorov Johnson Mehil a Mehil Abrami equation, which represents the time progression of phase transition to the experimental data. 
and determine the rate constant of phase transition K and parameter N. Here is the relationship between the rate constants of gated sufficient carbon dioxide gas pressure and temperature. The horizontal axis represents the difference between the pressure of the introduced carbon dioxide gas P and the gate absorption pressure of M11 P gate. We found that a characteristic curve proportional P to P minus P gate can be drawn for each of the rate constants at different temperatures. This suggests that the rate of gate absorption is amplified by increasing carbon dioxide gas pressure exerted on N11. And using this universal equation for the rate constant, we can predict that 95% of N11 will achieve the phase transition in 1.5 seconds at 250 kilopascal and 298 degrees Kelvin. Now I will show you our evaluation of the intrinsic thermal management capability of M11. Here we compare a rigid of HCAS1 and M11 to evaluate the intrinsic thermal management capability of M11 when applied to a rapid PVSA process for separating carbon dioxide and methane gas mixture. We assume the process composed of four operations, adsorption, rinsing, desorption, and parsing. And we also assume that all of the operations were performed under the adiabatic conditions. What do you see here? Uh, the characteristics of HCAS1 and L11 associated with carbon dioxide and methane separation. HCAS1 shows a typical Langmuir type item for carbon dioxide and methane adsorption. And the adsorption amount of carbon dioxide can be larger than that of M11. And the prediction from the ideal adsorbed solution theory using these single component adsorption items for HCAS1 shows that the composition of carbon dioxide in the adsorbed phase increases up to 90% when the adsorption of an equimolar gas mixture is assumed. On the other hand, in the case of M11, it is expected from the GCMC simulation that the fraction of carbon dioxide in the adsorbed phase is almost 100%. The four different card curves are the heat of adsorption for HCAS1 as a function of temperature. And we show these curves as isobars at each of the pressures of the four PVSA operations. The green card plane represents the heat received by the adsorbent which can be calculated by integrating the heat capacity of HCAS1 with respect to temperature. Starting from state A at 298 degrees Kelvin, the adsorption of gas mixture results in a heat of, heat of adsorption of 250 joule per gram. This heat should, should be completely received by HCAS1 because we assume the adiabatic operations, which is should result in um, increase of the temperature of the adsorbent up to 370 degrees Kelvin and a significant decrease in the carbon dioxide adsorption amount. These are the results for M11. We use some parameters obtained from the free energy analysis and the experimental results in this calculation. The red and purple isotherms, isobars for the adsorption of 
the gas mixture at 500 kilopascal and the pure carbon dioxide at 250 kilopascal show steep gap because of the gate closing of N11. Starting from state S at 290 degrees Kelvin, the absorption of gas mixture results in a net heat of absorption of 80 joule per globe, about one third that of HKS1. And it should result in a temperature rise of up to 335 degrees Kelvin. The temperature rise of M11 is smaller than that of HKS1, suggesting that the dritic thermal management of M11 works effectively and the adiabatic operations. This is a comparison of carbon dioxide separation characteristics of H custom and L11. When we assume isothermal operations at 298 degrees Kelvin, L11 is superior to H custom for the carbon dioxide selectivity and the degenerability. However, the carbon dioxide working capacity is approximately half that of H customer. On the other hand, in the case of the adiabatic operations starting at 90, 298 degrees Kelvin, all of the separation properties of L11 surpass those of H customer due to the intrinsic thermal management ability of L11. Next, I will show you an um, undesirable characteristic of L11 along with some potential solutions. As mentioned, flexible morphs have these excellent characteristics for gas separation. However, they have one significant disadvantage. Here we consider the separation of the gas mixture composed of alpha and beta. The alpha is the gas molecule, but the beta is not. In this case, a pure gas of component beta cannot be obtained at the outlet of an adsorption column because of the slipping of the gas molecule alpha differently from the conventional adsorbent. This is because the flexible morphs cannot absorb the gas molecule alpha when the partial pressure of the gas molecule in the mixed gas flowing in the adsorption calm de decreases below its intrinsic gate adsorption pressure. We confirmed that the slipping of phenomenon occurred during a breakthrough experiment using LM11. When an equimolar carbon dioxide netting gas mixture was passed through a column containing LM11, the slipping of carbon dioxide was detected at the end of the column. And the fraction of carbon dioxide was in close agreement with the ratio of the gate adsorption pressure and total pressure of the gas mixture. That is, pure methane cannot be obtained only using M11. One way to solve this problem is to add a secondary column containing a conventional adsorbent such as H plus one that has a Langmuir type pattern for the carbon dioxide adsorption. And we successfully confirmed that no slipping of carbon dioxide was detected at the outlet as shown here. Finally, I will discuss the design and assessment of the sequential calm system for the rapid PV assay. These are, there are two possibilities Two possible, there are two possible cases to determine the cost effective length of the secondary column. Case one is to cut the secondary column so that the amount of adsorbent is sufficient to 
remove only the slipping of carbon dioxide. Case two involves cutting the secondary carbon at the point where the first breakpoint and second breakpoints are merged into one. Um, this is possible because the conventional adsorbent has a Langmuir type item and thus the mass transfer zone to reduce the fraction of carbon dioxide from the feed to P gate over PT moves more quickly than that to remove the slipping of carbon dioxide. We then compared between the conventional and our proposed systems. The first system uses a single carb filled with each customer. And the other is a sequential carb where the first carb is filled with L11 and the second with each customer. We assume the adiabatic adsorption of the of an equimolar carbon dioxide emitting gas mixture at 500 kilopascal. And we adjusted the carbon length and the flow rate of the feed gas to obtain the same flow rate of F of pure mating at the outlets of the systems. This was done with the material balance calculations. And we found that our sequential calm system was 69% smaller than that of the single calm system. And moreover, the flow rate of the feed gas to our system was 62% lower than that of the single calm system. These results suggest that our proposed system can process a much larger amount of gas with high throughput carbon dioxide separation when both systems are the same size. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Shotaro. But before that, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Hideki. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions um start with some that we have from YouTube. Um, the first one's from Dimitri Lapshin. Uh, his question is, what is the scaling factor alpha in the classical force field equation and how is it determined? Okay. Yes, uh, we determined the alpha uh, to fit to fit the adsorption isotherm of carbon dioxide obtained from the GCMC simulation to fit to the experimental uh, adsorption item in this plateau region. When we use we when we change the alpha parameter, we will we have different amount of adsorbent. So this is quite uh, sensitive to the adsorption amount obtained by the GCMC simulation. So we determined uh, the alpha parameter like that. Thank you. Um, there, there's another from YouTube. This is from Arvind Rajendram. Um, his question is, uh, first part is a comment, the second part is a question. Um, the challenge in designing processes with these materials is the propagation of thermal fronts in the column that significantly affect the process performance. Um, now the question is, have you tried doing some detailed process simulations on materials like these? Uh, we, we've not done it yet. Uh, we only perform the material balance calculations. So yes, um, it's a really important issue. So we are now trying to develop um, PSA system and single calm adsorption system to, uh, to do such um, simulation. And we will determine uh, 
require the parameters using such experiment. So we are now trying to do that. Thank you. Um, and just one for myself. Um, for gated moths, this is something I, I work with more um, like zeolites and carbons, things that don't expand that much. Are gated moths reversible or is there a degradation of the material every time it expands and contracts or is it able to do this indefinitely? Um, are you ask, asking about the stability of the moths? Yes, uh, the moths? let me try um, rewording it. So how stable are these? Do you find that if you were to load it with one bar of carbon dioxide and then bring it back to, to vacuum, can you do this indefinitely or over time will that loading decrease? Um, yes, uh, we do not uh, perform um, that um, test, but uh, in case of LM11, the stability is quite good. So I think LM11 will be applicable in industry. Okay, and just a, a follow-up question. For, for gated moths in general, are we looking at this more as a physical, uh, physisorbent or a chemisorbent? Um, in case of L11, it's a kind of physisorption, not chemi chemisorption. Great. Okay, um, I don't have any more questions at, the, at this time. Um, if you do have more for Dr. Tanaka, uh, please put them in the Zoom or in YouTube, and we can come to them after um, Dr. Haraide's talk. So, um, yes, thanks, Dan. Um, our second speaker today is Dr. Shotaro Haraide. Dr. Haraide is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Kyoto University. He received his doctorate in 2018 from Kyoto University under the supervision of Dr. Tanaka. He then did his postdoc at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. His research interests include uh, modeling gas absorption and separation. As a reminder, um, during the webinar, you can submit questions either via the, um, the Q&A tab of Zoom or if you're on YouTube, leave a comment and David will forward them here. And uh, with that, I will hand off the, pressure, uh, the presentation to Dr. Haraide. So thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm Shoto Haraide from Kyoto University. Um, in the second part, I'd like to introduce a uh, recent works of this field. Uh, as Professor Tanaka has introduced, ELM11 has excellent absorption properties in a rapid PSC process. To put this promising material to practical use, we first need to study the shape forming of flexible MOLs to facilitate their handling and reduce the pressure drop in the absorption column. Thus, we modeled ELM11 pellets and found that the stepwise uptake in the absorption isom was similar compared to the powders one. And this is a serious problem because the superior absorption properties of flexible moths are highly dependent on the sharpness of the stepwise uptake. So in the present study, we aim to review the mechanism of the slacking behavior of data absorption on molded flexible moths and by free energy analysis using molecular simulations. First, I will show you the molding procedure. We dissolved polyvinyl pyrolism in pure water and added ELM11 samples to the slurry. Then the slurry was put, put into molds made of silicon sheet and dried at 308 Kelvin for 12 hours. And we prepared pellets with various weight fraction of PVP and measured CO absorption isotopes at 273 Kelvin. 
Um, please note that the vertical axis of this chart is the amount of soap per gram of ELM11. From this graph, we can see that as the weight fraction of PVP increases, the absorption performance of ELM11 decreases. To investigate the cause of this, we molded ELM11 into a sheet shape and measured the in situ XRD pattern and the corresponding to the, this point. The obtained XRD pattern contains peaks belonging to the closed structure and peaks belonging to the open structure, which indicates that not all of the ELM11 crystallize in the third undergo structure transition. Then what made the deformation of morphs morph particles difficult? To address this phenomenon, we focused on polymer binders. In powder form, MOF particles can freely deform their structure. On the other hand, in the pellets, MOF particles are covered with PVP molecules and their, poly their polymers would inhibit structural deformation. So we predicted that the slacking of the gated absorption is the behavior when and that occurs when flexible most exhibit absorption in this structure function under external force. The gate absorption behavior is the combination of the host expansion and guest absorption onto the open framework. To put this in some dynamic terms, the osmotic free energy of the system can be written as the sum of the Hellman force free energy of the host framework and the ground potential of gas absorption. And the gas absorption behavior is expressed as the timing when the osmotic free energy of the system is equal to that in the closed state. In this equation, delta F force represents the destabilization due to post expansion, and delta omega gas is the stabilization owing to the gas absorption. Similarly, the gate absorption and the external force can be divided into three terms, namely the host expansion, the gas absorption, and uh, the external force. So the osmotic free energy of the system and the external force should be the sum of F host omega gas and the external potential W. Therefore, the gate absorption and the external force occurs when the sum of these factors becomes zero. To test this hypothesis, we conducted molecular simulations using the simplified ELM level model. We prepared 36 simulation box consisting of seven unit cells with different interlayer bases. Then the destabilization factor due to post expansion was evaluated by the interaction potential between layers. And the stabilization factor due to the gas absorption was obtained by integrating the absorption isotopes on each simulation box calculated by ground canonical Monte Carlo simulations. First, let me explain the free energy analysis for gas absorption without an external force. Shown on the left side is the osmotic free energy change of the system at various pressures. This line is for zero pressure and represents delta F force itself. As the interlayer radius increases, the free energy increases because the expansion of the host makes the system less stable. On the other hand, when the interlayer width is large, the free energy decreases as the pressure increases due to the gas absorption. And the free energy profile is by stable at P3. In other words, the closed state is favored when the pressure is smaller than P3, while the open state is favored when the pressure is larger than P3. Since the closed state is too narrow to absorb gas molecules, while the open state provides enough space, the amount absorbed on the system jumps at P3. 
So this is the mechanism for the gate absorption. The gate absorption behavior and an external force can be investigated in a similar way. But it should be paid attention that the free energy profile in the previous slide was the free energy change of the unit cell with respect to the change in the interlayer width. In the absence of external forces, this profile is a good representation of the behavior of the whole system because all of the layers in anamorphic particles are essentially equivalent. However, when, uh, when external forces are taken into account, the free energy change of the morphic particle must be considered explicitly because the potential of the external force is a function of the total thickness of the particle. So, however, as shown in this slide, um, while a given H vector determines uh, unique D, a given D does not determine unique H vector. So therefore, to combine the free energy profile, we need to assume how the layers of the particle will deform. Thus, we consider two extreme situations. One is that all of the layers of the particle simultaneously deform with the same opening ratio, like this. And the other is that each layer of the particle deforms sequentially. And taking an amorphous particle consisting of six layers as an example, simultaneous opening renders the free energy profile having a large energy barrier. On the other hand, sequential opening results in five small energy barriers. So please note again that these are extreme situations and the actual system may take an intermediate pass between both of the two. However, for real MOF particles, it should be more natural to behave like sequential opening because the energy barrier is much smaller than that of the simultaneous opening. And as we described below, sequential opening is the key factor of the stacking behavior. Then how does the free energy profile change when applying external force? In the case of the simultaneous opening, the free energy profile of the of an amorphous particle subjected to an elastic potential but obtained like this. The elastic potential makes the state with large thickness less stable, which enforces, enforces the most stable state at P2 and P3 to be the closed state. However, the resultant absorption behavior from this situation is just an increase in the gate pressure, not the slacking effect. Then what about sequential opening? As mentioned earlier, the free energy of the MOF particle in this situation shows a wavy profile. Adding the uh, elastic potential to these profiles provided this figure, which indicates that the total, to the total thickness at which the free energy of the system becomes minimum depends on the pressure. Therefore, a uh, still like absorption isotherm was obtained like this. So this line appears discrete because we consider the particle composed of six layers. However, for a particle having a thousand layers like an actual MOF particle, the absorption isotherm program was continuous like this. So we conclude that this is the mechanism of the slacking effect. What you see on the left side is the external potential, uh, external potential profiles with various spring constants and the corresponding absorption isotherms on a morph particle consisting of a thousand layers. The slacking of the gate absorption became more pronounced as the spring constant increased. 
This trend is in good agreement with the experimental results because the more binder there, in, there is in the pellet, the more force the most particles should be subjected to. However, while the theoretical absorption isotherms show, show the linear increase, the experimental absorption isotherms show the curved shape, especially for the pellets with a low weight fraction of PVP. So this is probably because in a pellet containing a few PVP binders, a particle receive force, receives force from not only PVP, but also other particles. Namely, a particle receives the elastic force from the PVP binders at the beginning of the gate opening like this. On the other hand, when it expands to some extent, it collides with another particle and its structural function is strongly inhibited. This type of potential would be well expressed by the soft reproducible sugar potential, um, which was developed to describe the phase diagram of hyperspherical particles in the presence of microgels. So this slide compares the elastic potential and soft reproducible sugar potential. In contrast to the linear shape in the case of the elastic potential, the ice sums with the soft reproducible shoulder potential showed curved profiles, which is similar to the experimental absorption ice sums with the low weight fraction of PVP. So this indicates that the soft reproducible shoulder potential is a plausible model for the force exerted on ELM ribbon particles in pellets. But the more important thing is that. The degree of the tracking depends on not only the strength of the force, but also the force profile. To confirm it experimentally, we made pellets containing a small amount of PVP, but coated by a high concentration PVP slurry, so that the total weight of fraction of PVP was 0.32. The absorption isom on this coated pellet shows a sharper step than the pellet containing the same amount of PVP uniformly. This result should be explained by force profile dependence of the tracking effect and indicates that the performance of the sharp shaped morph is highly dependent on the molding method. So um, that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. And Finally, Professor Tanaka will summarize our talk. So I'd like to pass the button to the Professor Tanaka. Thank you, Shoto. Um, here is the summary of our work. First, um, combination, the combination of the free energy analysis, structural determination of the host framework, and multi simulation provides a uh, deep insight into gate adception. And the flexible morphs have excellent characteristics such as a large working capacity, high selectivity, pressure added fast gating, and intrinsic thermal management capability required for a high throughput gas separation system. And the slipping off problem can be solved by using a sequential count system. And finally, the free energy analysis using the simplified model through molecular simulations revealed that the slacking was caused by, uh, caused by the non-linearity of the external potential and the fact that not all of the flexible motifs in a um, morph particle are uh, necessarily deformed simultaneously. And here is a list of suggested reading. These four papers are about the free energy analysis for the flexible morphs, which are of most importance. And these four books are about the molecular simulations, density functional calculation, density functional theory calculations, thermodynamics, and adsorption processes, which are very useful. OK, 
Yeah, you go. Would you? Thank you. Um, finally, we would like to acknowledge these collaborators and Grant, as well as Jesse for the singleton radius radiation experiment. And now, uh, if you have any questions for part two, we will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we just got one in Zoom. This is from Marco today. Um, they ask, how does the sorbent behave in desorption when blended with PVP? Is the hysteresis loop affected as well? So thank you for your questions. So give me a moment to find the slides. So yeah. Uh, so actually, um, so the PVP is also um, absorption, absorption hysteresis like this. And uh, actually, I prepared some slides for the analysis for the hysteresis, but I had to cut due to the time constraints. So briefly, um, we can analyze the hysteresis um, by thinking uh, relationship between the energy barrier and some thermal fluctuation of the system. So let's suppose the thermal fluctuation of the system is 60 in this case. Uh, so I skipped the explanation. So, so briefly, the, if the system has a thermal fluctuation that uh, larger than the energy barrier, the system can as, uh, get opening and also can uh, get closing. And the similar way we can uh, analyze the hysteresis for the under, under, under external force. And uh, we can find that the hysteresis with us of the uh, of the gate absorption and the external force should be uh, should be extended as the amount as the amount of increase like this. So and absorption and desorption isomers on the part we have in the southern layers and the two external forces uh, obtained like this. So but the main trend does not change from the equilibrium result I've shown you. So I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Um, we just got another one also. This is from uh, David Danachi. Um, he's curious if you've tried other binders as well when you're trying to form these pellets of the, uh, the Elm loft. Yeah, um, thank you for a good point. So we have a result that the robustness of the pellet depends on the molecular weight of PVP binders. So changing the polymer binder would affect the tracking of the gate absorption. So actually we are currently testing several binders and seeking the best one. Thank you. Um, a question for myself. Um, I was just curious how long uh, computationally it takes to generate these isotherms. Are we talking on the hour, um, like order of magnitude of uh, minutes or hours, or does it take longer than that to generate these um, these uh, isotherms using GCMC? Oh, <laughs> uh, actually, I I can I can not the uh, correct to time, but maybe it takes uh, a day or well, uh, maybe a day or that because the model is very simplified one. So the computational time is uh, much smaller than the realistic model. Thank you. So um, okay. uh, we do have another uh, question. I'm just trying to, um, uh, it's from uh, the chat. I'm just trying to reword it.
Um, it looks like, um, so trying to uh, modify the moth with polymers, it can maybe uh, make some different space inside your adsorption uh, structure. Uh, which, I'm sorry, Alex, do you mind um, retyping your uh, question in the chat? I'm quite confused with it. We do have another question. Um, just uh, unfortunately not able to understand it, at least in the, the way it's written as is. We'll give them a couple of seconds to, to do that. And if not, we will uh, proceed. Sure. Um, Dr. Nymark, would you mind um, emailing um, Dr. Hiraide, your question. Yeah. Um, okay, so with that, um, I will ask Dan to share his slides. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hideki Tanaka and Shotaro Hiraide for your presentations on flexibility in MOFs and your utilization in CO2 um, separation. We also thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted to the IAS's YouTube channel with an announcement on the IAS Twitter feed. The hope is that the work to discuss today will be a useful resource for the absorption science community in the future. Um, the IAS Education Committee is happy to announce that the second IAS Twitter Poker Conference um, will be held between November 29th and December 3rd of 2021. Uh, this is similar to the one that we did last year. It is a no-cost event, um, and it is, uh, the aim is to promote the research of graduate students and early career researchers uh, by posting uh, your work as a poster to Twitter with the hashtag uh, hashtag IAS Twitter poster too. Um, more details can be found on our website. Um, one note is that registration is required to be considered for best poster prizes. Um, we will have a similar amount to last year, five valued at 100 USD. All right, thank you, Nick, for uh, moderating today's webinar. The IAS webinar series uh, will pause for October and will resume later in the year. Announcements regarding the next webinar and other IAS online events will be posted on our Twitter feed and through the IAS mailing list. We hope that you will join us. We also briefly mentioned the upcoming annual meeting of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers in November in Boston. The Area 2E programming area, that is adsorption and ion exchange, will host many sessions relevant to the adsorption community. We hope that anyone able to attend the ASAHE meeting will join those sessions. Social activities for Area 2E will also be announced on the IAS's mailing list. Finally, as one uh, additional reminder, uh, I'd just like to point out to the audience that abstract submission for the FOA 14 meeting is open. Uh, please contribute, consider contributing to the program and joining us for the week of scientific exchange and camaraderie that the FAO, FOA meetings are known for. With that, we thank you for joining us. I would like to say good night to our friends in Japan and the Pacific Basin. And uh, to everyone, we hope that you will join us again soon. Thank you and have a great day.